everybody knows, for example, that the restaurant industry is really exploitative. Anybody I know who has worked in the restaurant industry, I've worked in the restaurant industry, has had negative experiences in the restaurant industry. Nobody is on Twitter being like, we got to eliminate restaurants. That's never a talking point. Restaurants are bad and they should be eliminated. Uh, but that's exactly what's happening with, with pornography. I am joined today by Noelle Purdue. Noelle, thank you for being on Urgent Futures. Thanks for having me. Let's start at the start. What is your background? Who are you? Noelle, my background is in writing and production for the adult industry. So I've been in the adult industry doing writing, production, strategy, consulting, product development for uh, about 10 years. And I guess about six years into that, I left kind of my like full-time office gig in the adult industry and started doing freelancing. And a lot of my freelancing has been kind of journalism and speaking about um, the adult industry and specifically the history about the adult industry and how it relates to technology uh, and how it relates to kind of internet history and how um, technologies that we use today really regularly um, have often be, been heavily influenced by the adult industry and how that's not really something that we talk about, but I, I do think we should. Um, so that's kind of what I what I do. Amazing. Well, let's pick up from that. How has technology, the development of technology, um, particularly like digital technologies and the internet, been influenced by the adult industry? Oh my gosh, uh, way too many ways that, <laughs> for us to get into all of them. Um, but it's really something where so many technologies that we use now or, or you know, the way that we use them, um, the way that uh, it, we interact with technology and inter technology interacts with us has been shaped by the adult industry, uh, mostly because that's kind of where the demand is initially. And that's where a lot of new technologies um, find economic funding uh, and an interest. Uh, so I would say credit card processing is a really good example where um, and it's also a really good example of technology sort of turning on the adult industry, uh, where credit card processing and monthly subscriptions um, was something that was initially developed by and for the adult industry. Uh, so uh, porn stars with a kind of large uh, fan network in the 90s um, would create kind of personal websites where um, people could sign up for a monthly subscription to have access to their, their work. Uh, and that's, you know, it was credit card processing was developed for that system. And now obviously everything is a subscription service uh, and credit card processing has now credit card processors have really tried to distance themselves from the adult industry entirely, uh, which I think is a, a pretty interesting twist uh, that we can see uh, happening in, in a number of different ways um, throughout like technology and, and the history of it. So but that's, that's one example of genuinely dozens, if not hundreds. Yeah, and I want to get into the questions of cens censorship, obscenity law, um, and all the kind of myriad sp specific topics you write about. But before we get into the specifics, I want to stay broad for a minute. You know, the show is called Urgent Futures, and I think somebody might, you know, see the topic of porn in the adult industry and ask, like, what is urgent about that? And so I want to I want to kind of stay zoomed out for a moment and think about what does the adult industry reflect about society? Like, why is the adult industry um, important to society and why does it, why is it a, a, an important place to look to understand the values, mores, etc.? There's so many different ways to answer that question. I'm going to try to answer it in two different ways. One is sort of, I guess, the reason why I like porn, where I think it's a very honest expression of people's desires and priorities and, um, and values and and but that kind of goes both ways where it's it's also obviously it show, shows us a lot about what we maybe aren't valuing in society or what we're taught to not value um, and that's I think where a lot of the criticisms of pornography come from and so I, I, I find it a bit frustrating where, when criticisms of pornography kind of end with a criticism of pornography because ultimately pornography is responding to uh, a desire nobody in porn no company in porn is, is interested in, in 
in creating something that nobody wants, you know, um, it's always a response. And that response, like that, that, that need or that want is coming from, you know, how we've been conditioned to value things and how we've been conditioned to desire and respond to that desire. So if somebody has an issue with how something is being showcased in pornography, it's actually a conversation that, that needs to be kind of zoomed out much farther and, um, and sort of, it needs to be analyzed how that's kind of that, that want or that need um, is being created in the first place. So that's one thing that I think is really interesting where again, it's just pornography is just a mirror of, of what we value and what we desire and how we uh, are, are responding to that desire. Um, and then kind of secondarily, and, and what I often explore is that um, pornography, uh, it's often sort of referred to as a canary in the coal mine where a lot of things um, that affect kind of our larger sense of, of freedoms or privacy, et cetera, um, it, it often starts with pornography. The legislation starts with criminalizing pornography and, and sex work generally, but right now we're talking about pornography. Um, but I, I would say that it goes even farther than that, where I wouldn't even call it a canary in the coal mine. But um, in, in reality, this legislation that is written for the adult industry, where people maybe hear about it and they don't really care because it only applies to pornography, it really creates uh, this ecosystem of legislation that can be used to apply to uh, a much wider network of people and, and including, you know, communities that maybe somebody does identify with if they don't identify with the adult industry community. Um, queer communities is a really good example of that. So, uh, you know, pornography legislation is classified as obscenity law and obscenity law is what was used to uh, justify banning uh, drag. And so any, any kind of group of people uh, that could be labeled obscene um, which obviously that's many people, marginalized people in particular, um, have often been labeled obscene for many different reasons. Um, then automatically all this legislation that was uh, created for the adult industry, you know, for, finger quotes, the adult industry now automatically applies to those groups as well. So it's something that I do think people really need to be paying attention to um, because ultimately it, it can and it will affect them as well. Mm. Mm. And are there um, milestones? You 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 frame yourself as a as a porn historian, so I'm going to draw on, on that sort of hat you wear. Are there milestones that you can point to to demonstrate, like when you're talking about um, queer people being grouped in um, as obscene because obscenity laws have been written structured around sex work? Are there milestones that you would point to to demonstrate when and how that's happened specifically in the past? Definitely. I mean. Just the early days of the internet, um, it's really rife with examples of this uh, because people were really figuring out what the internet was and learning what it could, what, what it was capable of, and um, and also what they should kind of be scared of. And they were learning to fear the internet, and they were but while they were learning to love the internet, and um, and there were a lot of very passionate people um, who believed in the power of what the internet could be, and there were also a lot of passionate people that believed that the internet was inherently, you know, a source of, of evil. Um, and that source of evil was often linked to uh, pornography being widely available on the internet. Uh, and, and so that's a really good example of this. So pretty much all internet legislation, for better or for worse, um, has roots in people's fear of pornography on the internet. Uh, and that's often how, how these pieces of legislation are put through. Um, so for example, like the, the first iteration of what would eventually become SESTA-FOSTA, um, SESTA-FOSTA also was created obviously with adult content in mind, um, but the first iteration in, in the 90s, um, people were furious about it. People were really, really upset um, because there was a big philosophy going around that, uh, that the internet should be this sort of almost anarchistic space um, for freedom of expression uh, that would be sort of untouched by by government, um, untouched by, by legislation or law enforcement, um, which I, I believe was a bit optimistic. Um, they definitely, a, a lot of people believe at the time or are reported to believe that, uh, that 
I mean, actually, a, a direct quote is that, you know, people, kids in the, in the next generation won't know what nationalism is because of the internet. And that was um, a, a huge uh, MIT scientist said that about the internet, uh, which obviously that's not what happened. And people believe that there was no such thing as violence online because it wasn't physical, which I also don't really agree with. Obviously, there are many forms of violence. Um, but people were really upset at this initial wave of legislation around the internet that was brought in um, due to fear of pornography. And I would say rightly so, uh, that legislation ended up turning into sesta fossa which was also sort of a, a crackdown on um, adult content and sex work online uh, that has had uh, you know, a lot of really difficult uh, ramifications with regards to privacy and security online. Mm. Can you, just for the sake of, of like uh, covering our bases, could you describe what SESTA-FOSTA is and give a little bit of context also to what Section 230 is? Yes. Um, so SESTA-FOSTA is a piece of legislation that kind of at its base level criminalizes all types of sex work online, or it, it labels in direct terms all types of sex work online as uh, human trafficking. Uh, which is obviously criminalized and is also really offensive because of many, many types of sex work online uh, are just from people who have a uh, business uh, and they're certainly not human trafficking themselves. Um, so it's caused a lot of issues. It's also actually caused um, a lot of human trafficking. Uh, there have been multiple studies that show that sesta Foster has actually increased human trafficking. Studies show this, it's not speculation. Uh, because what it actually did was it removed a lot of these sort of safe spaces for people to um, better kind of share uh, safety tips or vet people that they were vet clients online. Um, it also prevented people from engaging in a lot of forms of online sex work. So they were pushed into doing in-person sex work, which does have higher rates of violence attached to it, um, physical violence in this case. Um, so overall, we don't like SESTA-FOSTA at all. <laughs> and Section 230, that was actually developed um, in like the 90s. I was part of the conversation around um, adult content and also other kind of like quote unquote high risk content being online when the internet was first becoming accessible and popularized is, you know, what do we do with this? Are, are the platforms actually responsible for this? And then SESTA-FOSTA also kind of put in place that like, actually platforms are responsible and if there are but i mean i say that but it's it's been obvious through how that's been enacted that only certain platforms are held responsible uh and many of the big platforms for example facebook which again there have been studies that show that facebook is actually the platform with the highest degree of human trafficking on its site uh facebook gets no slaps on the wrist for this nobody is 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 shouting about Facebook in the streets, even though it has been proven that Facebook has the highest rate of human trafficking on the internet over and over again, multiple studies. Facebook isn't being held accountable for this, obviously. Reddit isn't being held accountable for this, obviously. YouTube is not being held accountable for this. The only platforms really that are being held accountable, whatever that means, are adult industry platforms. So it's, it's very hard not to notice the bias there, given that there are multiple studies telling us who the culprits of this are, and nobody seems concerned. This maybe is an obvious question, maybe has an obvious answer, but I want to ask it. Why, why are social media platforms not held accountable to the same standards as adult sites? I think that there's a lot of stigma uh, that adult platforms have to deal with, and adult performers and adult industry professionals in general, I think that there are a lot of misconceptions about the adult industry. Um, there are a lot of, you know, justified uh, criticisms of the adult industry that get kind of expanded into something much larger than I would say they that would be helpful um, to be expanded into. Uh, and then I also think that it's it's you know, these campaigns are are funded, generally speaking, by by people who aren't necessarily good actors, let's say, they're, they're often funded by um, people with religious motivation, with anti 
sex motivation, with anti-sex work motivation, with anti-porn motivation. Uh, you know, these campaigns have a lot of money. Um, they're funded by organizations. They're funded by individuals. And these individuals and these organizations do explicitly have an agenda that is anti-sex and that is anti-porn. Um, so that's a huge part of it. Uh, I also think that there is a bit of a belief at this point that these bigger uh, mainstream platforms are sort of like too big to fail uh, or too big to criticize in a meaningful way, which is disappointing, where I think a lot of people have criticisms of Facebook, um, etc. cetera, uh, but I don't know if they believe that those criticisms could go anywhere um, or that anything would be done. Um, Although I will say, I, I don't think that it's common knowledge that Facebook is, is the biggest hub of human trafficking online. I don't think that that's common knowledge. Uh, but even if it was, I, I, I think it would just be a, one of, of hundreds of criticisms of the platform that have sort of gone unanswered. And people are like, well, you know, there's not really an alternative, so I'm going to keep using it. Or meta, the meta umbrella in general. Yeah, I mean, it even I remember when you know, the Facebook files came out, I believe in, in 2020 or 2021, you know, demonstrating uh, the deleterious mental health impacts for predominantly young women mm -hmm. that they just completely ignored and that the public, there was an outcry about and then kind of, it was kind of back to business as usual. Yeah, and I feel like that happens a lot, um, but with the adult industry, obviously you have the motivation, the religious motivation, the religious money, uh, the conservative money, that is able to sort of get that to a place where, um, where, where there's teeth to it. Mm. I want to talk a little bit about the work, the specific types of roles you held so that we can talk about your experience mm -hmm. of the industry and kind of orient audiences to what it looks like behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I know you've worked, you mentioned you worked as a writer. I know that you worked in at uh, model hub within Pornhub. Um, could you share a little bit about those various experiences and, and what you learned about the industry in them? Yeah, so at this point, I have had a lot of experience with a lot of different types of platforms of varying sizes and, um, kind of, I guess, structure. Um, I started out as a scriptwriter at Brazzers, or actually, I mean, even before that, I was writing for the adult industry, but my kind of formal job experience started at Brazzers um, as a scriptwriter, and uh, and that was really interesting because it's a, it's a very large studio, um, and it was a, a high volume production, um, so I was writing, you know, 12 scripts in the span of two weeks, um, so it was, it was a lot, um, and then I moved on to Model Hub, and I was doing kind of like trying to get larger, higher profile um, performers to join what at that point was a, a very new platform. Um, and a lot of that involved kind of like hearing grievances that people had um, about Pornhub um, in general, because that was a, a big part of the reason why people weren't joining this new platform. Um, and so I would kind of talk with people, I would, I would meet with them, I would go to a lot of conferences, um, and that was my job. And then, and then I ended up, I was also kind of the face of the brand. So I was in a lot of their kind of like ads or releases, et cetera. Um, I did a couple videos explaining uh, kind of how things worked. There are a lot of tools that people weren't really aware of that, um, that are really beneficial, like geoblocking, um, et cetera. Uh, so I would explain that. And then I really liked that work. Um, and I was trying to do more kind of video content that was about and for the adult industry. Um, so then I ended up uh, going to, moving on to the Pornhub side to do kind of digital production for their safer work platforms. So for YouTube, Instagram, et cetera, um, where I did like an interview series um, with uh, adult performers, um, things like that, explainers or data breakdowns. Um, and then I ended up quitting kind of during the pandemic uh, right before kind of shit hit the fan with my um, And then I started working as a freelancer. And since then, I've done uh, freelance work for a lot of different smaller companies um, and both studios and platforms alike. Uh, so I've worked as a scriptwriter. I've worked as sort of a, a managing, like, script, a script manager, I would say. Um, and I've also worked as a consultant. Uh, I've worked as a strategy officer. 
I've worked as a writer. Um, I've worked on a, sort of various campaigns. Um, so I, and, and these are all from, ranging from sort of like smaller uh, studios, new studios, um, startups, uh, really established companies that are, are, you know, more kind of women focused or kind of trying to, to cater to that market, which I enjoy, um, things like that. So I, I have at this point a really broad array of experience on the kind of product side or the, the platform side. Uh, and that's kind of my, my job. And I still work as a consultant now. A lot of companies also approach me um, trying to be able to just saying like, hey, I'm, I'm making a I'm making a platform. How do I how do I not you know mess up royally? Uh, and then usually I, I give them advice and, and sometimes they take it and sometimes they don't. <laughs> um, and so I've also, you know, I've written terms of conditions. I've 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 done kind of a lot of stuff at this point. Wow. I want to, I want to dig in on the, the script writing process because, uh, my first, uh, my, my first, um, professional like career job, um, was as a copywriter for like an entertainment copywriter. So movie trailers and TV spots. And that was a category that most people don't realize there are script writers for it. And I imagine the adult industry suffers from a similar, uh, misconception the kind of like well people are just kind of ad-libbing the yes. you know the plumber or whatever yes. um what's the script writing process like oh my gosh um that is like the bane of my existence i still run into it where and but when i was working as a script writer um both at browsers and, and and also with other companies anytime i was i would tell people that uh the the fun joke every time would be like i didn't know that porn even had scripts which for me only tells me that, that that person does not pay for their pornography. Anybody who is paying for their pornography has an understanding of the production value that goes into it. If you're just staying on the front page of a tube site where you're just getting a 40 second clip of what is a 40 minute production, yeah, you're not gonna know that. So for me, I'm like, the yeah, eggs on, on, on your face, buddy. Uh, but I do find it is a big pet peeve of mine because there is a lot of work that goes into porn production. Um, kind of no matter what kind it is, even if it's a gonzo script, it's a script, it's scripted. There's a concept, um, there is a certain element of choreography, you're also scripting usually, if you're part of a, a higher volume um, studio, you're also scripting the, the wardrobe, um, you're scripting, you're usually doing like some element of the casting, uh, you're doing the concept and the pitch, and then you're also writing the script. And if it's a membership site where they do kind of like higher production value, whatever that means at this point, um, that's going to be at least, you know, a 12 to, to 20 page long script that, that the performers have to memorize and they have to perform because there is a plot and there is a dialogue. And even, again, even if something is a gonzo script with no dialogue, there's still context that needs to be created for, for what's happening and what the, the audience should understand from the situation. Um, so, yeah, I wish that people understood that more. I took great pride in my work, and I do still when I do script writing. Um, but also, it, it is funny because when I was managing a, kind of a team of script writers, I would see kind of the like opposite end of that, where I was working with a lot of people who haven't, who hadn't necessarily script um, written scripts for pornography, uh, but they had written scripts for film. Uh, and so they would really over script in a way that I have to like consistently tone down where I'm like, hey, guys, uh, love the enthusiasm. However, let's just keep in mind at this point, at this point in the scene, they will, these two people who are real people will be actively having sex. So maybe, maybe let's, let's take out the grunts and the moans specifically and let them kind of. <laughs> work that out like that there are elements that that should be improvised um, and then there are elements that that it's it makes this the whole production a lot easier if they're not mm. and would you say like are there are there lessons that you learned from script writing for porn that you apply in other domains of because you because you you have a very wide-ranging writing practice um, you publish with washington post um with slate um, you've also, as you just mentioned, written terms and conditions. Um, so yeah, are, are, 
have you have you seen any like uh improvements or any lessons learned from 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 that experience definitely i mean i i love writing for pornography because i think that it's very forgiving um i i think people are really willing to suspend their disbelief for pornography it's one of the many reasons i love it as a medium um but and and it's also taught me kind of to to play around with people's expectations of a, of a medium um, and kind of have fun with it no matter what it is and people people like fun <laughs> is I would say what pornography has taught me um, people like fun people like to be surprised uh, and also I try to make everything really accessible um, that's definitely something that I've learned in pornography where um, where things should be accessible and and I don't personally believe as a writer my 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 goal has never been to put a, an audience member or a reader in a situation where they feel frustrated. Um, I want the process of reading something or watching something to be uh, enjoyable. And if I'm challenging a reader, uh, which I do kind of more so now in my mainstream journalism, if I'm challenging the reader on a, a concept, like maybe how they perceive the adult industry, I don't really want to challenge them also um, in, in the way that I'm writing something. So even if I am writing for, you know, Wired, where I know that the audience is, is statistically speaking educated, I'm not really trying to push the boundaries of that because why would I? Uh, I'm not an asshole. <laughs> um, and like, it's not like, I'm not, I'm not giving them a pop quiz. Um, so that's kind of what I, I like. Like, I, and, but then there are also ways, you know, in, in pornography, sometimes I would slip in, you know, a bit of like a, quote unquote, higher brow joke or like a, a meta moment. Um, and that element of surprise people always really liked. Um, so I do like to do that in my other writing as well. Mm. You brought up uh, like when people say like, I didn't know porn had writers, that that was a giveaway that they're not paying for porn. Obviously, like Model Hub in many ways front runs OnlyFans and OnlyFans is a major part of the adult industry now. How many people, maybe from a from a broad percentage standpoint, do pay for their porn? What categories of or what payment structures are finding the most success? Um, and what are the, I guess, again speaking very broadly here, concerns um, or areas uh, that that performers and sex workers are particularly attentive to in terms of making their living, making sure that their you know right to make a living isn't stripped away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I want to open up that kind of economics. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, I question. personally can't speak for performers. I'm not a performer. Um, I can speak for the platform side of things, having experience in that um, and seeing kind of how much money these platforms make uh, and, and, and also being in a situation where I was on the platform side. So I know, I know how much money people make. And, and even, even when I was kind of with this bigger platform, however many years ago, I would have conversations where people people had had no idea that people could even pay for pornography, and they and they found that concept laughable, uh, which was really interesting. Um, that there was this sort of, I feel like it was almost like a bit hush hush paying for porn when I when at least first started, and now I will say it's it's much more normalized to pay for pornography and. I have a lot of criticisms uh, for OnlyFans, a lot of criticisms for OnlyFans. However, I do think one thing that they did is that they did help normalize paying for pornography, um, which I really like. I do think people should pay for porn. And it's also, I think, really exploded um, the genre uh, that was kind of maybe 10, 15 years ago was referred to as quote unquote amateur porn. Obviously it's not amateur whatsoever. Uh, people are making millions of dollars and have, they have highly complex uh, production quality. Uh, but now it's sort of independent. It, it normalized independent producers. Um, not that it was like not a thing before OnlyFans. Um, there were many, many subscription services that existed before OnlyFans. Um, there were also uh, many clip sites. I would say that the wave before kind of the OnlyFans model of subscription just prior to that, it was clip sites that were kind of having a moment. And clip sites were posted mainly independent um, creators. Um, but 
also say is that I do think it's it's a lot more normal now to pay for pornography. And I also think that um, independent creators and independent creation is a lot more normal. And and when I was first starting as a scriptwriter, um, someone not knowing that there are formal scriptwriters was really was a tell that they maybe didn't pay for porn because at that point, a lot of the, the paid platforms were studios um, that had kind of like, they would host, you know, really explicitly um, produ- produced content where it would be it would be something with a with a traditional plot, etc. Whereas now, um, it is much more normal for kind of Gonzo style um, pornography to be to be what people recognize as porn. Um, however, I do think that uh, even with that, uh, there is a level of production value that I don't think people realize is required where, you know, even if it's, even if there is no dialogue like that performer had to come up with that concept and, and execute that concept, you know, which is a lot of work. That's, that's production. It's not just like, it's not just like done on the spot. Like there's, there's planning involved and there's work involved. And I do wish that there was more acknowledgement of that for, you know, studio side and independent side. Mm. Yeah. There's also, I mean, um, it seems to me that there's a there's one major category that OnlyFans also normalized was the sort of crossing the parasocial chasm where you actually have sort of direct interface with performers. Um, you brought up critiques. You brought up that you you have critiques of OnlyFans, and so I can't help but ask, um, what are those critiques, if you can share them? Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, I mean, <laughs> I I don't like when companies that make money off of pornography don't align themselves with the adult industry. And OnlyFans is such a good example of that, where they have always sort of taken the stance of like, well, you know, we're, we're kind of turning the other way, but, but we're, we're a platform for, for influencers. Like we're a platform, we're just a regular platform, not for porn. Don't, don't look over here. And, and then that was sort of really kind of brought to, uh, the forefront, you know, three years ago when they threatened to, or they, they decided to ban all adult content and then obviously reverse that decision less than a week later uh, because there was so much outrage because the vast majority of their platform is adult content and also they uh, are, you know, facilitating the income of now a number of performers that were horrified to learn that this platform was just going to boot them off just like that after making millions and millions and millions of dollars off of them. Um, and, and I also think that generally speaking, and, and I, this comes up a lot in my kind of um, consultation work uh, where I really encourage new companies to, uh, particularly new companies that are built by people with no adult industry experience. I really encourage them to, uh, be comfortable with aligning themselves with the adult industry and and learn to love porn and the porn industry and for that not to be like a dirty word. Um, I have a lot of people coming to me saying, "Oh, like I want to change the porn industry. That my product is gonna is gonna fix it," which I have a problem with because to me that that's kind of you can have criticisms, but if you don't like porn don't make porn, <laughs> you know, like that, that's setting everybody up for failure. And I also think that it speaks to like an, uh, a lack of responsibility. If you don't align yourself with the community, you don't feel responsible to that community. And therefore that community can't rely on you. Um, and we've seen this happen a bunch of times. Uh, so, and, and OnlyFans is a really good example of that happening where it did not align itself with the adult industry community and it was ready to betray them at the drop of a hat and and people still feel that uh level of distrust and, and they should um because only fans again is still kind of trying to produce this like reality style content they're still trying to market towards like a more mainstream influencer base they are still trying to get away from the fact that they're a porn company which they are so that's that's mm. part of my criticism of the platform mm. this seems to be a recurring uh pattern where tech companies, credit card processors, what have you, make a ton of money uh, aligning themselves with porn in sort of the shadows. 
And then once they've popularized their yeah technology, payment processing, et cetera, then and they want to you know get pr- pr- uh, sort of you know progress a certain image of of who they are in the public, then it's kind of like cut and run. Yeah. Um, is that just is that is that just repeating itself? Is it getting any better? Like where are we with that? It is repeating itself, and it's not getting better. It's happening literally right now with Etsy, which I talked a little bit about on my page, but. Uh, they just issued like a huge anti-sex ban on their platform after being uh, really building itself up as a platform that was quite liberal with what it allowed. Um, and within a month, they're just banning everybody uh, and all products that, that really have anything to do with sex at all. Um, so it's, it's still happening. It's happening literally as we speak. Um, my personal favorite example of this happening is Tumblr because uh, there was there was swift and, and delicious retribution uh, where obviously Tumblr um, was essentially you know it was it wasn't a porn site but if you were on Tumblr pre 2018 it was a porn site and uh, and they in 2018 banned all adult content of any kind the wording was really vague and it was uh, quite strict uh, and you know. Within four months, they had lost 30% of their user base. And they ended up, Yahoo ended up selling Tumblr after that decision for really 2.5 million, uh, just a few years after buying it for 1.1 billion. And, and that is, you know, an example that I like to reference of, you know, you bit the hand that feed you, that fed you, and, and it didn't work out. Um, and I need to have those in the back of my mind because there are a lot of a lot of examples like credit card processing where you know they're doing fine um, and the adult industry is left to sort of struggle in the wake of that. Um, but I'm curious to see what will happen with Etsy. Uh, OnlyFans is another example where they tried to pull that, uh, and then the criticism was so severe that they kind of went back on that decision, which is good. Um, and yeah, we'll see. We'll see what happens with Etsy. But it's still happening. And I guess, again, not to ask a too naive of a question, but why? Like, it seems to me that it's not difficult to make an NSFW part of your website. That doesn't seem to be a hard technical problem. That doesn't t- seem to be a hard like content moderation problem. So why cut off what is either a major source of revenue or traffic when you don't need to? And it varies depending on the situation but it is also kind of the same every time where with tumblr and obviously this is this is all speculative but it's also speculation with a lot of proof um uh but you know with tumblr because they they always say that's for the safety of their community that's always the reasoning that is always the public statement is that it's for the safety of their community even if that makes no sense whatsoever um, with Etsy, it makes no sense. They, they were regulating the content. Um, it did have to be tagged as mature. It did have to be censored on the first slide. Uh, nothing explicit was allowed in any kind of public area of somebody's shop. So they were, they were regulating this. Um, but, but, you know, for them, I, I think, I believe it's a response to the current legislation where that is being enacted kind of across the United States where various states are enacting really, really strict their, their age verification laws um, on any site that hosts adult content. Um, so I think that they just didn't want to deal with that. Um, I think that they probably could have, you know, developed a, a separate entity to host this product, these products, but um, they're not particularly interested in, in backing up their sellers who they've made, how, whoever, who knows how much money off of. Uh, and so they just decided to ban it. Um, with Tumblr, uh, that is because they also claim to sort of save for their community, but in reality, it perfectly timed up with them getting kicked off of Apple's App Store um, because you can't be on the App Store if you post nudity. Um, and so they said that it was for the synergy community. It's probably because it got kicked off the App Store. Um, you know, it's it's slightly different reasons every time, but it's it's generally speaking this sort of like they're weighing their options um, between either doing something that's a little inconvenient or potentially losing um, 
uh, the one part of their audience in order to protect and stand by um, another, or in Etsy's case, to protect and stand by their, their seller community. Um, and they're, they're choosing to just write off the kind of adult industry or uh, sexual content whatsoever. They're, they're making that decision. And, and kind of everybody else is just left to, to pick up the pieces. But generally it is, resp- is, a, is a response to something. Mm, mm. What would you say are your, let, let's do, let's do sort of two, um, sort of scenarios. One is what's your ideal scenario for how porn lives in society, um, and the, um, societal conditions that would make, um, you know, uh, would make the porn industry, you know, as, as, as amazing as it could be. And then maybe south of that, what do you see as being an ideal within the current set of conditions under platform capitalism? Like what are the changes that could happen at the level of a credit card processor or an Apple that in your mind aren't these massive structural changes, but are just simple things that would make the case better for them and make the case better for the porn industry? Mm -hmm. I mean, I would love to start with more education around pornography in general, like media literacy around porn. Uh, more education about, or sorry, any education about pornography in the school system, I think is necessary. Uh, I think a lot of the kind of responsibility ends up being put onto the adult industry to both provide this entertainment medium and also educate people about said (laughs) entertainment medium all at the same time, which I believe is just ridiculous. Like I, I do think that it is the responsibility of the educational support system in parents in the literal education system to educate uh, these these children, these young people about how to consume the media that they're exposed to. Uh, there are media literacy classes. There are classes about how now being being developed on kind of understanding various forms of media. There's no reason why pornography should not be part of that and in fact there are so many reasons why it should be part of that and it should be a a, a huge part of kind of sexual education around media literacy um, but we just don't have any of that Uh, and again there is this sort of expectation that the adult industry should provide that education which is ridiculous like the bachelor the, the abc network is not coming out with you know educational series on why the bachelor is not a good example of in real life dating like nobody expects abc to come out with a literacy program about how to watch reality television even though reality television is something that is complicated and should be taken with a grain of salt nobody expects abc to do that but they do expect every single porn company and every single porn performer to provide that education on their behalf and that's just not reasonable so i would love to see way more education around porn media literacy to begin with I would also love for there to be an understanding that the internet is not for children. It was not developed for children. And it's, it's not, it's not a place that caters exclusively to children and it it shouldn't be a place that caters exclusively to children. Not every place in sort of, you know, the, the physical realm caters to children. You shouldn't bring your child to a bar. You just shouldn't like you shouldn't bring your kid to the strip club. The strip club should still exist. Bars should still exist. Just because something does not cater to children doesn't mean it shouldn't exist. And we have an understanding of that in kind of the physical world, but we don't have an understanding seemingly of that online. Um, And I think that that's an issue. And I think that that's my problem with how a lot of these platforms and a lot of this legislation is kind of written and justified is that it's justified for, for children where I'm like, no child should be on Instagram. You know, we should barely be on Instagram. It's not even good for us. Like, if your kid is on Instagram, maybe that's that's a you problem. You know, like maybe that's your responsibility, given that that's your child that legally you're responsible for. You know, like you are responsible for what they consume. And if you're putting them on a platform that is made for adults, they might see adult content. And I do think that people should be able to choose whether or not they see, you know, explicit content mature content, I do think that people should be able to make that choice, but I think people should be able to make that choice. And instead, that choice is being made for us by, you know, these, these policies and this legislation. And I don't think that that's appropriate. Mm. I really appreciate that point. 
um, particularly around the onus of responsibility for educating and communicating falling on the industry itself in the same way that we would, you know, it, it's not a good thing when um, corporations self-regulate, um, like you need outside parties playing different roles in collectively coming to sort of consensus about where things sit in in society. And, and also thinking about the internet not as a place for kids. I think about all of the ways in which kind of using these really like uh, triggering hinge pieces like around children and health um, are used to kind of Trojan horse bad ideas in under the guise of you know, something good. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of the, um, the Nick Kristoff New York times piece that it, you referenced this moment where shit hit the fan for Pornhub. And, um, you know, you're one of the key subjects in money shot. So this is a moment to say everybody, if you haven't watched that documentary, please watch it. Um, most of all, because Noel's amazing in it, but also it's a really illuminating uh, documentary about Pornhub. But one thing that's outlined about that moment is that, what gets bundled into this Pornhub expose is this sense that um, porn is rife with sex trafficking and particularly child sex trafficking. Um, so I guess to start with that, what was your first reaction when that uh, piece came out? You weren't at Pornhub at that point, but obviously you, you, you know, spent a good part of your career there at that point. So what was that, what was that feeling like? Well, I had left, one month before this <laughs> this launch oh, genuinely wow. one month before um so it was really surreal uh it was also really frustrating because i hated that piece um for so many reasons i hated that piece i thought i think it's extremely irresponsible journalism for so many reasons and, and there's been many people have have said that and analyzed it and but i i passionately hated that piece i thought that it was really irresponsible and um in bad faith journalism. And I also felt really frustrated because I had just left Pornhub. And you know, when you leave a company, when you just leave your job, you just want to be like, screw them. I'm, I'm on to bigger and better things. I'll never think about them again. Like no matter what kind of relationship I think you had with the workplace, even if it was positive and you know, for the most part it was positive, but, but any kind of, like, if you leave a job, like, it's like an ex, like, you don't want to think about them, you know, and, and then I was in a position where I felt like I needed to defend Pornhub, and I was like, this is crazy, I'm not even on their payroll anymore, you know, but I did feel the need to, to defend it, because, because I think, I, I thought that the piece was so irresponsibly done, um, and also was very obviously sort of a takedown on the entire adult industry, uh, which has been kind of talked about in many ways before where it does feel like Pornhub um, is used as as this like this sacrificial lamb almost for to 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 represent the entire industry uh in a way and and, and Pornhub is you sort of used as shorthand to reference the entire industry which I don't believe is fair whatsoever the Pornhub as a brand does not represent the entire adult industry um and also like you can't kind of pick and choose things you want to go after and and, and apply them to millions of people and, and hundreds of and thousands of companies. It's ridiculous. So I hated it. <laughs> I felt bad. <laughs> yeah. And so just for, for listeners who maybe haven't read it, um, the article was interviewing folks, young, young people, I believe that one of the subjects was 14 who, um, had had trouble taking, um, revenge porn or like, uh, materials that, that were, you know, shared without their consent onto Pornhub, which hadn't been taken off of Pornhub. This issue of content moderation, it kind of comes back to the Section 30, 230 stuff. It comes back to um, Basta Sesta. What's your, like, let's start broad. Like, what do you think is the responsibility of platforms as moderators of content? Um, and what would your ideal, you know, relationship that the platform should have with with moderation i mean i i didn't have a problem with that element of the piece i will say i i do think that Pornhub and every platform um has has a responsibility to uh, to to what they're kind of hosting to a certain degree um and i don't believe that kind of unverified tube sites embody that responsibility and that was my criticism for Pornhub while i was there uh, because I was having a lot of conversations with 
with performers and a, and a big part of why they didn't want to join Model Hub is because a lot of the content on Pornhub was unverified, uh, meaning that it was pirated, it was not consensual, it was uh, image sexual abuse material, et cetera, et cetera. They didn't, and they didn't want to participate in that, uh, justifiably so. And so I had been, I had spent, you know, the majority of my career at Pornhub saying, hey, we need to do, we, we, we need to verify this content. Like, if you want people to join and if you want to kind of respond to this, this legitimate criticism, you have to verify your content. Like, you're, you're a huge brand and it's ridiculous to be hosting so much unverified pirated stuff. Um, and, and they, they had no interest in that. Um, and, and that is a problem. I think that and now, now everything is verified kind of the response to the, the Nick Kristoff piece, I will say the, the positive was that it did push Pornhub to enact mandatory verification, which is a good thing. All pornography, all, all material of any kind, I believe uploaded, like it, it, there should be somebody like attached to it. Um, there should be res- somebody responsible for it. If nobody's responsible for something and it's just floating, you know, it, nobody's responsible for it. It's that's that's not generally good. Um, yeah, so I do I do believe that platforms have a certain responsibility, and I wish that Pornhub had verified their content and enacted verification, you know, much much earlier uh, on its inception, really, um, and it didn't, uh, and that's a problem. And there are still so many of these these tube sites that exist, these aggregate sites that have um, so much content that is pirated and um, image-based sexual abuse material. And and I think that that's really a shame because I also think that that is kind of like a a, a dark mark on the industry, if you will. And I think that it's it's a lot of the, the justification for kind of hating pornography in general is because of these kind of, I would say, bad actors in the industry that are, that are um, that, that feel no responsibility towards uh, hosting content that is damaging um, and that is immoral. Right. And this is not to excuse the bad actors, but getting back to your earlier point, if Facebook is the place where child sex trafficking is happening at um, rates and volumes that vastly outpace um, adult sites, then if you're acting in good faith, then you want to go after the places where it's happening the most oh, exactly. or, or to have the, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I think that that's where it becomes complicated because like I, I have no interest in, in defending um, platforms that are, that are hosting image-based sexual abuse material, that are hosting pirated content. I have no interest in, in defending that. It's, it's immoral and it's wrong, but it is ridiculous to, to, to not point out the double standard there where, where if we're saying that and if we're saying that that's wrong, which we are, and in that situation, we are saying that's wrong. Then, then shouldn't you be five hundred times as angry at Facebook if there's five hundred times more of that exact same material? But, but we don't see any of that anger, and we don't see any of that discussion. Um, and so, so that becomes that really, I think, complicates the conversation. Mm. Were there other you, you referenced thinking that 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 piece um, was an example of bad faith journalism? Were there other um, specific points that you took umbrage with other than what we've already talked about? Well, I, uh, Nicholas Kristoff was not very forthcoming about, um, the background of the organizations that he was working with, um, for the piece. Um, so he was working with Exodus Cry, uh, which is a notorious kind of very conservative far right Christian organization. Um, for a long time, they were, uh, <laughs> They did this whole purity pact thing uh, that people, they encouraged people to sign on for that was um, extremely homophobic. So it's a, it's a homophobic organization. It's an anti-sex organization. Generally, um, their motivation is not to rescue anybody. It's to get all pornography and all adult content and even all kind of any any kind of content that even hints towards it banned, um, and that includes Sports Illustrated. They they classify Sports Illustrated as pornogra- pornography. Um, so he was really working specifically with this organization without disclosing any of this information, um, with just just sort of painting them as like an anti-trafficking organization, which just isn't true. Um, this organization also has a long history of exploiting. 
um, these victims of, of these uh, these situations and kind of which I believe the the um, piece was also very exploitative. There were multiple pictures um, of of these these very young girls um, of their face, of, you know, and and kind of using them for this story. Uh, it turns out that Exodus Cry has a long history of using these young girls um, in this way for their 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 products or their promotions um, without providing them any actual support, um, which is what they claim to do. Um, there are a lot of sort of, uh, many of these girls themselves have, have kind of come out and said that, hey, I had a very bad experience with this organization. Uh, they did not provide the support that they promised me and yet that they, they used me in, in my face and my story for all their promotional materials. So I have a huge problem with the fact that, that was, none, none of that was disclosed uh, and the, the organization was painted really in one way in the article. Um, so yeah, I don't really like it. I don't like that, that he used um, images of, of these young victims. Um, I do think that that's exploitative uh, practice and and I, I also don't like how, you know, if you're going to do responsible journalism about human trafficking, um, you have to do responsible journalism about human trafficking. Uh, and instead, this was essentially like a hit piece on one specific uh, platform without kind of bringing in any of the studies that have been done on human trafficking, any of the, the studies that have been done on, on platforms in general. And it's also something where the term human trafficking now has become uh, quite broad, where image-based sexual abuse material and um, uh, CSAM, uh, child sexual abuse material, uh, which is what was on Pornhub, uh, is being directly referred to as human trafficking, uh, which I think is mm -hmm. a bit complicated because uh, these materials, they, they have, there's terminology for them, image-based sexual abuse material, child sexual abuse material, and and that is what the platforms are responsible for. They are responsible for the material itself, and that's that's what it is. And it's still horrible. It's still illegal, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but human trafficking, um, specifically the trafficking of, of humans, the, the sale, the et cetera, that is something also specific that I believe should be spoken about clearly, and, and the terms of that should be spoken about clearly. And that is something that if we're using the terms of trafficking humans, that's what happens on, on Facebook, you know. Um, again, lots of evidence to back that up. So I think that it it it, it made the co the conversation really unclear, uh, and it also I don't believe was written in good faith uh, for for many reasons that I just explained. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. There's another line of critique about porn, which has to do with uh, it being a drug, it being addictive. What stock, if any, do you put in in those critiques? I have complicated feelings about that. I don't love that kind of talking point. Um, I don't believe that pornography works the same way as an addictive substance. However, uh, porn is something that uh, provides dopamine and can be absolutely fixated upon to an unhealthy degree, like anything that provides dopamine, any type of, of stimulative media uh, can. Um, and but I but I do think that it should be spoken about, like any kind of stimulant media. Um, I don't believe that it's something where you know if you start, if you subscribe to some nice girls only fans, like two years later, you're you're do absolutely doomed to be like trawling the internet for the the most depraved thing you can possibly find because, because you're just, you, you know, there's, it's, it's a, it's a downward spiral and, and nothing will get you off anymore. Like, I don't believe in that. Um, a lot of people have been watching pornography for their whole lives and they just like the porn that they like. Uh, it's not, it's not like a, you're not sentenced to depravity, whatever that word happens to mean for you. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't love the, the term, but I also think that, you know, we can, we can absolutely have conversations around um, people feeling dependent on porn. Uh, we can have conversations around around people being hyper fixated on porn. But again, I think that those conversations um, should have a lot more to do with our educational system and uh, the lack of media literacy around pornography. And I think that that would do quite a service to addressing that. Mm. 
It's amazing how many problems would be solved if we had better media literacy. So true. <laughs> um, I think about I think about like you know whatever whatever we'll think about him. He he gets a lot of attention. Um, Scott Galloway running around saying that like porn is like rotting, uh, particularly young men's brains, and he seems to be saying that in good faith. I don't agree with the conclusions that he's drawing. But I'm curious to know, like, when you see people like that who are not operating from a place seemingly of um, malintent or from a place of manipulation or with this, like, very specific, um, you know, moralistic agenda. Well, I guess there is a bit of a moralistic agenda, but but not like a, you know, Christian nationalist moralistic agenda. Um, how do you feel? Like, do you, is that... Are they provoking worthwhile conversations? Is it kind of a net negative yet? Like, and I mean, yeah, I guess I'll just leave it there. I do think it's a net negative, unfortunately. I don't think that it goes far enough, the conversation or these talking points that are, are really simplistic, um, because again, it never gets applied to, uh, to education. It never gets applied to kind of reaching out to find out like what these, these young men are sort of what void is being filled again it goes back to what i was saying about pornography no one in pornography is is looking to uh create something that nobody has ever wanted um it's always it's always responding to a need it's always fulfilling a need and it's always a mirror and so if if you don't like what's being reflected back there's something that needs to be addressed and and i think that that is i think that saying that that young men are being influenced by what they're seeing in pornography is true. And I do think that that's a problem. I, I do agree with that. Um, but for the, for the sort of like conclusion of that to be so porn shouldn't exist, instead of the conclusion of that being, we need, we need to reach out to young men more effectively and we need to have better sexual education for young men um, is very confusing to me. Um, because because I think that it's it's a very closed uh, mindset towards it, and it's almost approaching it like this is in a vacuum, like pornography is in a vacuum, and how young men act around pornography is a vac in a vacuum, and it isn't. And and I and I think that any anyone with enough in, in, intelligent, I think that Scott seems like an intelligent man. I think that he seems intelligent enough to know that these issues aren't existing within a vacuum. I think that he's intelligent enough to know that there are a lot of issues with, with young men um, fixating on something and, you know, maybe, maybe mistreating their partners for whatever reason, um, dehumanizing women. And I don't think that that exists within the vacuum of pornography. Um, there are so many other ways that that's being expressed, whether it's through like the incel um, red pill movement, et cetera, and it's very bizarre to me for an intelligent person to sort of choose to ignore all of these other factors to target pornography specifically. Yeah, that makes total sense. And it, it reminds me of another kind of zone of critique that I've seen emerge recently, though I'm sure has been going on for a long time, um, with like, of all places, I encountered it randomly on Twitter on the, the decreasing amount of times I end up on Twitter, um, I was like algorithmically served a thread that was outlining all these different moments of performers or ex-performers describing um, exploitative industry practices or abuse on set and things like that. Um, how do you how do you think about and respond to um, yeah, messaging and critiques like that? I think I, I... I think the porn industry should be criticized. I don't. I don't believe that it's above critique whatsoever. I don't think anything is above critique, and I and I don't believe the porn industry is above critique. I think my problem is that, generally speaking, the literacy and understanding around the porn industry is so poor uh, that people aren't able to engage with critique um, genuinely and and in in a thoughtful way and and as a result it's it's actually it's it's frustrating because that actually means that change is less likely to happen if you're not addressing something specific uh and if you're just saying porn is bad it's like well what are you talking about specifically and that, that's usually a conversation that i have is is when people kind of 
ruffle their feathers at the idea of pornography or, or they say something very broad to me like well porn is so misogynistic i'm like okay well well what what do you what how are you defining porn in in that criticism like and then they're like oh well you know like like i just go on like uh, like porn hub and i see like all of these like um, i don't like the way that things are titled and i was like okay so so you've seen some specific um scenes that are titled in ways that you find offensive um but would you would you think that you know like what about this example of porn do you think that like if two people are having sex if there's like a couple having sex and they want to upload this because they're they're um they want to show off themselves or feel very proud of it do you think that that's exploited or do you think that's misogynistic and usually they're like no and i'm like okay well we can start there um that's pornography so 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 that's an element of pornography that you seem to be particularly you seem fine with or or they're like well i don't like that you know um People, people come, like, I think Mia Khalifa is a really good example of this. If people have consumed Mia Khalifa's sort of anti-porn um, story, they'll be like, well, you know, Mia Khalifa uh, has said that it's it's really exploitative because she doesn't have ownership of her content. And I'm like, that's that's a great criticism. That doesn't mean that all porn is bad, but that's a, that's a legitimate criticism that can be addressed and should be addressed. Um, so, and that is actually, it's not a criticism of pornography generally, it's actually a, a criticism of uh, you know, lack of ownership uh, in the studio model, um, as opposed to the independent model. And then I can say, oh, well, then you would probably be more interested in uh, content that's that's on like a platform where every creator maintains the ownership of their content because they're an independent creator and they're not working with the studio. Uh, but uh, but people, some people do really like working with studios because they don't want to go through the hassle of doing production, um, and it offers them sort of like a a base rate income, et cetera, et cetera. So like, that's why sometimes the studio model works well, but that's not to say that it shouldn't be criticized. You know, like I, I just don't like when these genuine criticisms of an industry uh, get exploded into this unrealistic porn is bad and we should eliminate porn mindset because that that only goes to, to ensure that no, no, no criticism will result in actual change because you're not, you're not, making real criticism. Do you know what I mean? Of course. Yeah. And I mean, first, I mean, first of all, the Streisand effect. So yeah. anytime you're trying to like banish or suppress, you're going to sort of inadvertently um, make the sort of interest and demand stronger. But also I really love what you're saying about these being underlying issues that porn, because it's a hot button subject activates, mm. but then the problem then becomes that porn becomes a conversation and not the underlying issue. Yes. It's like the underlying issue is exploitative labor practices that porn, like many other industries, is using rather than. Yeah. And nobody, you know, no, like obviously everybody knows, for example, that the restaurant industry is really exploitative. Anybody I know who has worked in the restaurant industry, I've worked in the restaurant industry, has had negative experiences in the restaurant industry. Nobody is on Twitter being like, we got to eliminate restaurants. That's never a talking point. Restaurants are bad and they should be eliminated. Uh, but that's exactly what's happening with, with pornography. Mm. Yeah. Please don't eliminate restaurants or pornography. Yeah, exactly. um, you wrote this amazing piece a couple of years ago about the movie pleasure, um, which at the time was being touted as like the realest, rawest depiction of the porn industry. What was your, um, critique of that film so that was a really interesting experience writing that because i i had almost like too much context um and i will admit that um from like a journalism standpoint i i i was biased uh because but i think biased in a in a in a legitimate criticism way where i was critiquing the uh the yeah, yeah. It's not bad. That i was i was critiquing the movie and the movie again the movie doesn't exist in a vacuum. And, um, and I, I knew that people had a horrible experience on set. The actual performers had a horrible experience. Um, I heard from a number of people um, that they really didn't appreciate it, that they had like a really kind of unpleasant experience with the director, etc. cetera. And, uh, and while I was kind of researching this piece, uh, nobody, nobody wanted to like whistle blow on the piece itself but I also think that that kind of experience you could see in the movie you could you, 
could see it. And also it was really frustrating that it kind of was touted as this really kind of revolutionary, whatever, um, movie, uh, when it was so much like any other movie about porn that had already been made that was really negative, that was really kind of coming from a voyeuristic standpoint, um, from like a, a I'm going to use the term trauma porn standpoint, where it felt it followed like the exact same um, plot points, where it was somebody who joined the adology, like a, a, a hot, super young girl who didn't know anything about the world, but just was so horny and sexy. And then obviously had like a horrible experience um, that was really kind of dramatic and visually shocking. And and then she she managed to get out. She managed to save herself from this horrible industry. You know, it's that's what every movie about this industry has been. And it's, it's really tired. Um, it's very obvious who that cares to and what mindset that caters to. And I didn't think it did anything new except for the fact that the visuals were really the she really did her research on on kind of the visual genre of studio porn in that era, which give flowers where, where they're deserved. That was great. She did her research, and that's because she had so many people who were within the industry helping her with that um, and telling her about about how, how, like, what houses in L.A. to rent um, that are, like, porn houses. Um, she had a lot of actual porn stars working with her that are were, like, industry vet- veterans. Um, and she also didn't like from what you know allegedly wasn't super kind to them so that's that's my experience writing about pleasure so it was it was interesting where i i didn't i didn't really care for the movie um i didn't really care for how it was received um (laughs) so that's that i didn't give it a very positive review that's that (laughs) <laughs> you, I mean, I felt like you were, I mean, you were fair as you were just now to, to talk about what, what was working in that piece. You also brought up, I think it was in that piece or a different piece of yours. Um, you brought up that it took a couple of years for you to broach the subject with your mom mm-hmm. about what your work was. What was your journey? Well, first of all, let's, let's actually, let's, let's start even earlier because there's this like amazing moment, um, in kicking off money shot where, you're asked what your first encounter with porn is. So let's start there. And then from there, talk about what's your journey to ultimately deciding that you want to work in that industry and then how you then circulated that with, with your friends and family. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, that was actually, I think I talked about that while I was writing up Bridgerton. Um, about oh yes, that's right. That's right. Um, because yeah, my mom was like, why, why are all my friends loving Bridgerton so much? And I was like, hmm, I don't know, mom. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, I, I I think I've always like really enjoyed pornography as a medium. I mentioned this a little bit earlier, but I think it I think people are much more willing to suspend their disbelief watching porn, which makes it a really fun kind of experimental medium. Um, there's there's a, a lot of kind of ability to experiment and to be really kind of silly and and wacky in pornography that I don't think um, many other mediums have have the freedom to do so I also think that that pornography is sort of freed from from the prison of, of institutionalized legitimacy uh, where you know nobody's nobody's really making making porn uh, to get an Oscar uh, which I think there are a lot of benefits of that because people are actually able to express what they want to express and make something that they want to make, not what they think, you know, a a team of people deciding what the best movie looks like, um, want to see. So I always, I always really liked it. I liked going online and kind of trying to find the weirdest thing that I could find. Um, and it, and pornography was just a medium that continued to deliver me like, really surprising things and I think that I learned a lot about humanity and and the the spectrum and diversity of what people uh, find appealing or what they want uh, through pornography um, which I I thought was just kind of an endlessly interesting hobby (laughs) of mine and then later on I, I had been writing for the adult industry I have written for like a number of different um platforms like sugar platforms etc um escorting platforms and i was doing a lot of that type of writing and i was also doing some comedy stuff and i kind of decided i had actually just done like a um 
a boot camp on full stack web development. And I thought that it was super boring. I finished it and I was like, I do not want to be a web developer. Uh, oh my God. Um, and I was like, I don't want to, I just don't want to do that. And, and I want to do something that I would think is fun. And then I was thinking about what I would think it would be a really fun job. And I was like, I really want to do like parody porn. I want to write parody porn. Like that would be the best. Um, because again, there's so much room to be really silly and goofy with it. Uh, and, and like, I thought it was so fun. It was a medium that I really appreciated. And so I, I Googled like porn parody scriptwriter because I had told like all my friends, I was like, this is my dream job. Like I'm, I'm just going to keep working like, and eventually I'll get there. And then I Googled it and, and there was, they were hiring. <laughs> there was like actually a, a, just a job application open. Um, and it was all, like, could apply online. And so I did, and I ended up getting that job. And so and, and it was for browsers, which does a lot of porn parody stuff. And, and I had a blast with that. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, I was writing, you know, like the, the, the dick joke per minute ratio was, was crazy. Um, and, and I had a lot of freedom. I did a lot of Food Network parody uh, videos, which I thought were, were really fun to make. Um, and I really enjoyed it. And, and I think it's kind of been interesting going on a journey from then to now because and I was talking to you about this a little bit earlier but um a lot of my work now is really serious and I talk very seriously about pornography and I talk very seriously about the adult industry and a lot of what I talk about has very high stakes um and obviously porn is so political and that's kind of why this has <laughs> happened because I care about porn and it's and it's very hard to care about porn uh and not be serious about it because um, because it's so politicized. Uh, but it is, you know, part of me is a bit sad because obviously I got into it because I thought it was really fun and I wanted to have fun with it as a medium. And it is hard to do that in my position now. Um, or I think that my work has become quite serious, which is which is interesting. <laughs> but it is it is hard to like get silly with it when when you're talking about image based sexual abuse material and and obscenity law. It is very tricky indeed. Um, one thing you have been talking about, which I could see opening up space for um, being serious and comedic, is the umbrella category of AI and porn. Um, so what are you tracking um, in that intersection right now? Yeah, I mean, that's been really interesting because, as I said, I kind of have a background in, in web development or like I've, I've been interested in kind of computers and technology for a long time um and a few years ago like 2019 2020 i played a lot around a lot with ai and, and generative networks um which at that point it was very kind of new and fresh and fun and now it's become so sad but <laughs> but uh, but yeah i played a lot around uh, around a lot with with kind of AI art and AI creation a long time ago, um, back when, you know, you would have to train something for like 500 hours and then you would get like a squiggle that like vaguely remember, resembled what you were going for and you'd be like, oh my God, this is crazy. I did it. Um, and now, you know, you can just type something in and it generates like 18 flawless and extremely sexy versions of it in like 2.5 seconds. Um, but, but yeah, so that's been kind of interesting is, is seeing those like worlds collide because when I was doing kind of AI experiments with AI generation, it was kind of to showcase how difficult it is to sort of, to get, um, to program something to understand obscenity uh, because obscenity is such a, an emotional uh, concept and it's also a very individual concept which is why it's created so many issues uh, in the legislative system is that it's, it's not really something that has a clear definition um, and to sort of to try to program it as, as something that can be binarized just hasn't been very effective and we've, we've seen the ramifications of, of that being attempted um, so many times with so many platforms. Um, and so I would kind of, I, I, I made, I made AI porn. <laughs> I generated AI porn, um, by training a, um, a generative network on explicit images, um, and, and frames from, uh, 
scenes from like various kind of points of pornography's history. Uh, and then I, I kind of made it generate stuff, um, which was also kind of ended up being an interesting project in understanding kind of like the visual genre of porn uh, when you take out nudity and when you take out sex like there's still a visual genre that's clear throughout the years which i think is really interesting because i don't think people really think about like genres of pornography besides like the sex genres but you know in the 19 in the quote-unquote golden age you can tell if something is golden golden age porn even if there's no nudity on screen you know like there there are certain elements that really come out that came out when i was kind of generating things like for example there's a lot of um, outdoor scenes uh, that are very clearly in the Midwest. Um, there's a lot of like very similar wood paneling. Uh, for some reason, barns come up a lot, um, <laughs> and just like things like that that you kind of kind of see, and you're like, oh, that's that's interesting that this is part of this as a genre, um, even with no nudity. But um, but yeah, and and I I ended up kind of showcasing what I had generated as as this like. And then I, I ran it through Google's, Google has like a tool, like an, an API tool that is uh, essentially like a, a digital moderator of nudity. Um, and the images that I had generated looked nothing like human bodies. Again, this is like four years ago, uh, AI. And so it was just like squiggles and blobs. Um, but then I would feed it through this also kind of automated system um, of something that's trying to to see it, to, to guess if something is pornographic or obscene and and then I would like take like the things where where, where the API was like this is 99.997 percent porn and then I would show people being like this is what this is what the bots think porn is like this is why you can't uh, program something to understand something that's that's inherently emotional um, and so that's how I was using it. Uh, and then now AI porn is like everywhere and AI porn is on so many headlines and people are, are so stressed about it. And, and it is really interesting to see. Um, and I do, I, I, I think I'm kind of like, I was an, an AI artist before AI art became evil, <laughs> you know, like, like when, back when we, like, it makes it sound ancient, but back when we had to, like, train our own uh, <laughs> systems, like, like, you know, like, before it was just sort of this farm of stolen content, um, and, and it was really fun, like, it was really fun then, it, it really felt like artists were genuinely collaborating with, like, technology, um, instead of, collaborating with a huge system that has stolen everybody's work uh and I miss it I miss that and I and I hope that one day like AI can be like in, in my in my ideal world AI reaches a point in, in legislation around AI and and moderating or, and like managing um theft in AI and, and, I, and I want there to be legislation around that um, because I, I do want AI to be used as like a fun tool I remember when it was and I hope that we can get there eventually but but if we can't, then then we can't. Yeah, I've seen I've seen there's definitely a movement. I mean, um, Ido Steil wrote a really wonderful piece called Mean Images, which is like following up on her idea of the poor image, um, which is a, a long piece that makes a lot of claims. But um, one of them is like trying to address large models with reinforcement learning through human feedback is not the right way to think about making AI you know, right. Um, but rather, you know, the small bespoke handcrafted, um, ethically trained models, um, is the way. And so I'm, I'm encouraged that some of that will be there, but of course I think the genie's a little out of the bottle, um, when it comes to just generative AI being everywhere. But I, I, and I want to talk about that, but one thing I wanted to say, um, just to kind of put a fine point on it, because the work you were just describing is, is how I discovered you. I saw that video on TikTok. And I thought it was such a deft way of not only demonstrating everything you just talked about, but then also demonstrating how machine vision works, how computer vision works, and how we it really demonstrated the the delta between what we think of as vision and making sense of pixels that you know we think have to cohere to a certain you know level of clarity 
Um, but there's a totally different way that algorithms are, are understanding images. And, uh, I'll try to find that if you could send me that, um, that, that image, actually, I'd love to include it just so people can see how not pornographic or even, I mean, it looks like an abstract painting. Yeah. Yeah. I can totally, so I can send you one of my most highly rated by Google's, uh, nudity API images. I'll send you one of the 99.97%. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, but back to the generative AI stuff, you've been, um, you've been producing some videos around, um, the subject of deep fake porn mm -hmm. and calling for more specificity in, in what we mean. Um, and also, yeah, just, just kind of like getting into the subject with, with folks in a way that I think is really deft. So I wanted to invite you to talk about Oh. deep fakes from a technological standpoint and yeah deep fake porn yeah definitely i mean i think that i've been talking a lot about the terminology of deep fake porn uh because i've been really frustrated with how the term deep fake porn has become shorthand for uh non-consensual digitally edited materials um which i don't like for multiple reasons um first and foremost i don't like when the term porn is used to reference anything non-consensual i believe that if we're talking about non, uh, something non-consensual it, it becomes it's not porn anymore very similar to how if sex is not consensual we no longer refer to it as sex uh i think something similar should be should be done for pornography where pornography is an entertainment medium that's what it is uh if something is, you know, image-based sexual abuse material, if it's illegal content, if it's evidence of abuse, that's what it is. It's evidence of abuse or it's illegal, uh, not consensual material. It's not, it's not material made for consumption and entertainment purposes. So I, I, I really want those two worlds to be, to be recognized as separate. And this is also why I have issue with, and there's been a lot of critique over the years of the term uh, revenge porn uh, and a lot of kind of victims of what they are asking to be called image-based sexual abuse material um, have come out and, and said how harmful the term revenge porn is because and it's also resulted in a lot of really confusing loopholes in legislation because uh, because of the term pornography and it, it makes it sort of this this um, the sexual crime when it's it's more of a media crime and um, and then and then sometimes it results in, in the media itself not being um, criminalized or not being made illegal so it can pop up in other places it's resulted in a lot of issues um, same thing with with quote unquote child porn I really don't like that term it should be child sexual abuse material um, and a lot of kind of legal documents about about this have have had to be updated because they were originally written uh, with those those kind of colloquial terms and now have to be updated and so i really want us to just like start off a little bit better with deep fake porn and 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 refer to if we're talking about non-consensual digitally edited materials let's refer to it as such um, so we don't have to do this whole rigmarole of, of having to go back and edit like every single legal document that comes out about something um, because it's it's just not <laughs> best practices um, and so I have been talking about that I also think that it's a shame that it's being used as this this short form because as I was talking about before like I, I do I do want people to be able to use digital tools um, creatively and I, I do want people to be able to uh, use it to kind of express whatever creative vision that comes to mind and, and just because something has been deep faked does not inherently mean that it is non-consensual the term deep fake doesn't inherently imply not a, a lack of consent um so like there could be somebody that that whose face is deep faked onto somebody else's body and they both consented to that like that is that is a a, a very legitimate possibility and if we criminalize or we demonize the entire uh, concept of deep fake porn, um, then that eliminates that completely as a tool that could be used to make something fun. Totally. And it, it makes total sense that you're fighting this fight right now, because anytime something is built into the foundations of a thing, it's very hard to go back and sort of retroactively change that. But what you've demonstrated so clearly through the course of this conversation is that however true that is in other categories, it's 
exponentially truer when it comes to pornography. Yes. Yeah, definitely. And and I feel like people don't realize how much legislation that is written kind of with the adult industry in mind can affect them. And, and that's kind of what I really want to talk to people about is that, that you should care about this, even if right now it's only affecting the adult industry. Like you should pay attention because, because this, that actually makes it way more likely for this to affect you. Like, from a legislative standpoint, that a precedent is being set, uh, legislation is being written that can be used to influence and affect your life. Mm. Are you aware of any countries um, or consortia that are um, speaking about legislating, et cetera, developing policy around porn that you think is, um, you know, uh, that they're a luminary, that they're, that they're the example that other countries should, should look to? <sighs> I don't think so. I mean, I'm sure there are maybe that I haven't heard of. I think unfortunately it's it's something where the squeaky wheel gets the grease in that the the worst the worst examples of legislation gets the critics attention. Um, but I mean, not that I have seen personally. I think that there is a huge wave happening in fact that that I am concerned by. Um, similar to kind of the red wave that we're seeing, we're seeing a similar conservative wave of legislation geared towards adult material. Um, and that, that I think is, is, is speaking a lot louder than, than, you know, who knows, maybe there is like a, some Swiss town or whatever that's being really cool about it, but I haven't heard of them. <laughs> You've been very gracious uh, with your time talking about all of this stuff. Um, I know that you're, you you are putting your uh, comedy hat, back on somewhat with some work that's that's um, coming along. So I'd love to invite you to share about that. Oh, thank you. I mean, I think that I'm I'm beginning to launch a couple of things, but one is is close enough to launch that I'll talk about it, um, which is not, it doesn't have to do with pornography. Um, I was talking to you, Jesse, about this a little bit earlier, but um, I, I want to have like a space where I can sort of talk a little bit more casually and, and have a little bit more fun with writing. And I have, <laughs> I have a hobby, uh, of, you know, doing kind of reviews and deep dives on candy, which for me, um, in my mind, it makes perfect sense. Um, and fits really well with my interest in porn, but not everybody sees that. <laughs> um, so I am putting that on a separate platform. So I'm starting kind of like a similar kind of analysis on kind of the business of, pleasure but as it relates to candy and junk food um and i'm starting that on substack I'm watching that very soon maybe it will be launched by the time this comes out well we can we can uh, time it accordingly um where did i mean this is maybe a stupid question but like where did your interest in candy come from like particularly like beyond enjoying eating candy like uh reviewing that type of pleasure i think it's almost identical to pornography where for me like I think that it's really interesting to think about like the context of something um that is created for pleasure or that is not, not necessarily regarded with like high value or or much criticism and I mean obviously pornography as an industry is is criticized but pornography individual pornography material is not really reviewed the same way as mainstream material and very similarly, I don't think that junk food or candy, et cetera, um, is reviewed or thought about the same way that it's more kind of quote unquote higher end counting parts are. Uh, and I think that's kind of too bad because I, I personally think that things are enjoyed better with extensive historical context, <laughs> um, <laughs> including candy. And, uh, and I also think that it's something that people have a really emotional relationship to and, and candy as a business similar to pornography is is trying to cater to a very emotional relationship um, that has a lot to do with memory that has a lot to do with um, desire and perception uh, and and I think that that's really interesting and, and whenever I, I like research a candy I find out something really fun and weird about it or I'm like that doesn't make any sense at all but I love that that happened um, and, and so, yeah, I think it's very similar where, and I've, I've really had that perception on it for a long time. When I was like eight, I read the book Candy Freak. Have you ever heard of it? I haven't. By Steve Almond. It 
was my favorite book for so many years. It's still one of my favorites. And it's about a man that, that kind of goes on a journey to visit um, kind of the last remaining independent chocolate makers in America and also talks about kind of the history of chocolate and the history of um, these big corporations in chocolate. And uh, and I, I was like, it completely changed my world and, I, and it completely changed how I looked at um, candy forever. And, and I thought it was just such a fun way of, of thinking about it. And I kind of want to also try to engage with people in, in a similar way of like, hey, let's, let's kind of like think about this a little bit more because this industry is so weird and we have such a weird relationship to it. And it, and everybody has some sort of emotional tie to candy. Uh, and I just want to tap into that a little bit. Amazing. I can't wait to read or listen or however, however that's making its way into the world, whatever format. I have three questions that I like to ask every guest. Um, you've, you've hit on things that could conceivably be answers to these questions already. So feel free to draw those back in or extend them or, or, or what have you. What is one thing you wish people paid more attention to? Oh, I wish people paid more attention to history beyond kind of history as we know it, not beyond history that we get taught in school. But if we're talking about something and if we're thinking about the future of something, whatever it is, I think the most important thing to kind of look at and analyze when thinking about the future is kind of thinking about the past and, and what iterations this has already gone through and where did it come from and the historical context for something. Uh, because in so many ways, we, we, we see things repeat or we see things act in cycles and in so many industries and so many um, developments in technology and, and uh, the way people interact with technology. It happens so cyclically, but I, I do feel like we forget every time or, or it's, it's really bizarre that, that, you know, as somebody that talks a lot about kind of the quote unquote future of porn, that's kind of why I'm a porn historian is because, you know, if we're, if we're talking about the future of porn, we have to look at the, at the past and we have to look at, at what cycles pornography has already been through and, and how that influences what we're looking for right now. And, and I think that that also goes for whatever we're talking about is like, you know, the future of social media, the future of AI, the future of this, this, this. I, I don't feel like enough of the past and history is kind of brought into that conversation. Mm. One follow-up to that is, are there any, you know, in this category of like future of porn, are there any lessons or moments from history that you think are particularly relevant for right now or for the, you know, relatively near-term future for porn? I think I, I talked a little bit about like cycles and on my own social media, like cycles of the adult industry, um, where right now we're seeing obviously OnlyFans and the subscription model uh, really become popular and people are referring to it as if it's a new thing when, I mean, not only was OnlyFans not even the, of the first dozen to do that, um, but it's also, you know, the subscription model for me is kind of like a, a repackaging of uh, the membership model that I talked a little bit about earlier, where beforehand, like in, in the 90s, um, individual uh, porn stars and creators and performers would, would make their own site where people could subscribe to them monthly to get a record of, of what they're doing and, and access to, to more content. And that's, and they would pay with it, pay it monthly through credit card processing. And that's pretty much exactly what uh, this new version of subscription modeling is, is, is doing. Um, so I think that when we're like, what's next? Like, I, I really want us to, to be like, okay, well, well, what came before that, you know, like, and, and, and what came before that was more of like a forum interaction, more of like a community interaction. So I'm, I'm curious if that could play into what happens next. Um, I'm also curious because we're seeing like a, 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 a surge of people being familiar with, with the concept of paying for pornography. Um, and that is something that, that also like, that was really normal in like, you know, pre-internet pornography, like when, when it existed sort of in parallel to the mainstream film industry where you would pay to go see a film, you would pay to buy a magazine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so it's, it's, it's not, 
it's not like what anything that we're seeing is new. Like everything is is repackaged. Everything is just a new version of something that we did before. But so so rarely in, in anything, and I think that, that that this goes for kind of technology as well. So rarely is something the first version of itself at this point. You know, like at, at this point, we're seeing iterations on iterations on iterations. And by the time it gets to sort of mainstream understanding or mainstream access, it's been through iterations. And and, and I think the same goes for pornography. So I, I really want us to, to, to think about when we're thinking about the future of porn, be like, okay, well, what happened before? Mm, I love that. What is one resource you use or recommend to make better sense of reality? Oh my God. I don't know. Touching grass. <laughs> um, resource. I, I mean, I love the library. Um, I'm, I'm the daughter of a librarian. So I like really ride for the library system. And not only is it, uh, I think a great actual resource, but I think it's something that like, when I remember that the library system exists, I'm like, okay, all right. Like, like it calms me down a little bit, you know, like even if I haven't like, like checked out a book in a really long time, just knowing that it's, it's there and it is essentially like a, a, a socialist infrastructure that has become really normal in, in a late capitalist hellscape to use the internet term. Um, makes me feel a little bit better. So it's both a good resource for actual resources and it's also a good resource for feeling like a little less horrible. Amazing. I am an active user of the library, but particularly uh, for eBooks. It's an amazing, yes. like people don't realize this. It's, it's, it's amazing for eBooks. Um, so yeah, get your library card. Mm -hmm, exactly. And finally, what is one moment when your sense of reality was disrupted? During the pandemic, I really felt like we had so much forward political momentum and I could really feel it uh, and I, I, we could see it. Like there were so many things happening and, and so many conversations and, and actions and, and it really seemed like it was a turning point and, and then it just wasn't and, and everything just sort of back, went back to a worse version of what it was where everything went back to essentially what it was, but, you know, obviously COVID still exists and there's now no regulations or, or response to it. And also groceries are a hundred times more expensive. Um, <laughs> and, and it's just really, I, I was really surprised by that. And it did disrupt my, my sense of reality because I, I was confused by it and, I was disappointed because how, how does all of that momentum just dissipate like that? And it, and it really challenged my understanding of, of political action and, and, and revolution. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I, you know, I'm sitting here in the United States of America in the summer of 2024. So I, I'm, um, I feel a lot of, uh, kinship and, and, um, shared frustration and confusion about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, maybe not to shifting. End on a bad note. Yeah, yeah, not to end on a bad note. We we talked <laughs> about candy and junk food. Um, are there any other projects or initiatives or um, things that you wanted to shout out? And where can folks find you? Yes. Um. I mean, folks can find me on Instagram. I'm all underscore day underscore breakfast underscore. Uh, I think I'm not on on Twitter too, although I'm not super active on Twitter. I have a TikTok. Um, some stuff is on there. Uh, otherwise, um, I think things that, that people should, if, if people are interested in what I've been talking about, um, keeping up to date with organizations like Free Speech Coalition, um, it's great. Xbiz um, consistently, it's a, Xbiz is an industry magazine, so there's a lot of stuff that is kind of industry specific, um, but they also do a lot of really good reporting on kind of the legislation and, and and political issues that affect the adult industry um i don't i don't really think that that expos um gets gets the flowers it deserves sometimes i think that there's some really really good journalism happening on expos um that isn't shared as widely um as some other 
you know, non-industry platforms, but it is a really great resource if you're kind of interested in this sort of thing. Uh, and yeah, and that's kind of, and then I'm, I'm working on a podcast because aren't we all, but, uh, that it hasn't been, it's not, it's not close enough to launching to really get into it, but eventually. All right. Well, I'll keep an eye out. Noelle, this has been hugely illuminating. Um, your clarity of thought is just astounding. And I just want to say thank you for being on Argent Futures. Thank you for having me. This has been such a pleasure. Thank you for allowing me to, to talk about so much stuff that I love to talk about. It's been so nice. Amazing. This podcast is edited and produced by Adam Labrie and me, Jesse Damiani. The podcast is presented by Reality Studies. You can learn more by visiting realitystudies.co. And if you appreciate the work I'm doing, please subscribe and share it with someone you think would enjoy it. Thank you.